Tonight, we're going to be looking at the nature of light, the connection between physical and spiritual light that Ben had already mentioned. All around us, we see beautiful nature. We see the beautiful green trees as they start to change colors in the fall to get ready for winter. We can feel the wind on our faces. We see the the blue sky, the deep blue oceans. We see the, the beautiful purple flowers in the springtime. We see all these wonderful colors and wonderful nature all around us. And tonight, I've always wanted to do a study and take a few pieces from nature and see how our God shows us who he is through those things and the connection that he shows us with the spiritual light. The Bible is completely full of these connections, and sometimes we just need to search and find those. The, the lesson really hint, uh, hinges on Romans 1, 19 through 20. Now, I knew that from the beginning, because of course, as you read, you'll kind of find out. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them for his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. And we'll come back to this verse at the end of the lesson. But just just think about this. We've probably read this several times in our lifetime. And we kind of glance over it and we say, okay, we understand God created the world. We've, we read that all the time in Genesis 1. And we just kind of skim over it and let it be there. We just keep on reading. But what I want to emphasize to you is that there's a deep connection with the nature of light in this very verse here. And we're going to get to that towards the end of the, of the lesson. Acts 17, 26 through 28 says, And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods in the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of our own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. God has attributes. He has divine nature. It's right in front of us all the time. Tonight we're going to look at the physical laws of nature, namely his light, and we're going to apply this spiritually. We're going to look at the physical light in a scientific way as well and be able to apply this to our lives spiritually. God's awesome creation is all around us, and it's amazing. We just need to open our eyes and look. We live and move and have our being in him. So where did light come from? That's always the first question you should ask. And, and naturally, you can point to Genesis 1. This is where we're going to start. Genesis 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. So of course, naturally, this is our first question. So then our next question is, what is light? From a physical standpoint, we see light as nature's way of transferring energy through space. And you might question, okay, well, where's Jeff going with this? Light is literally energy. And if you think about it, what was the first thing that was created? It was light. Why would God create light first? Well, let's just think for one moment that you are the creator of the universe. Are you just going to create a stick figure that can't do anything, that can't move, that can't have a personality, that can't physically do anything at all? No, the first thing you're going to create is light in the form of energy. Energy that we can use to, be, to move and be productive. Think about it this way. If God created the sky first, how would it produce rain? If God created the land first, how would the tectonic plates move? If God created the sun, stars, and moon first, how would they be able to reflect the very light that he created? If God created the birds first, how would they fly? Or if God created the animals or even humans, how would they be able to perform the tasks that God asked them to create without first creating the light as energy? See, light can be perceived as the basic building blocks of atoms. 
Because without the energy that light gives, atoms would cease to be able to do what they were created to do by God. So light is the basis for all physical creation. When light created Genesis, in Genesis, all aspects of light was created. In the rest of the lesson, we're going to go over these properties. So we have scientific properties of light. As a light is a wave, and we're going to be talking about visible light. And it's also a particle, energy. And this is literally quantum mechanics, which wasn't discovered within, uh, until within the last 100 and 120 years or so. Well, light allows us to see physically and spiritually. We see here the electromagnetic spectrum, which is, see if I can get the pointer to work. This guy right here is what we're talking about. This is light, this entire thing here. And right here, this little section is kind of blurry, says visible light. That's what we can actually see with our own eyes. And we're going to get to more of this uh, in a little bit. But physical light allows us to see the little, where I was pointing to that little section is the physical light that we can see. In this model, a changing electric field creates a changing magnetic field. This changing magnetic field then creates a changing electric field, thus creating light. And I know that sounds crazy, but that's, that's the definition of what it is. Don't get too caught up on these scientific definitions either because we could be here all day. But the spiritual connection, Matthew 5, 14 says, You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. And in the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. It allows us to see physically, allows us to see spiritually, it allows others to see our good works, it allows them to see our heavenly Father. We see in Psalm 119, 105, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. We don't want any other way except the light to our path. We think sometimes that we want to go on our own path. We think we're lost or, and we need to try to find ourselves when all we have to do is open up the good book and the light will shine us in the correct direction. It will allow us to see spiritually. And who is the light? It's Jesus. So light also doesn't need to travel through a medium. This is kind of confusing, but just for, uh, for one moment here, meaning light doesn't need something to carry it in order for it to work. And that's when you hear the word that light can shine in a vacuum. And you guys may have heard that from science class back in the day. Uh, things that need mediums is everything else except light. So to give you some simple examples, I wrote a few things down, like a slinky needs its coils to move. A water wave needs water. A stadium wave needs fans in a stadium. A jump rope needs a rope to move. Light doesn't need any of this stuff. Spiritual light, the connection is, does not need good times to shine. It can shine any time throughout hard times, and good times. We all have good times when we get married, when we graduate school, when we have children, when we become baptized, when someone else becomes baptized. And there are bad times in our life too when we have a death of a loved one. When we, have, when we fail in temptation and sin, light can still shine through those moments. When we see a fellow Christian fall away, there is still potential that that Christian can still turn away from their sins and come back. They can see your light in you. And even when it appears that the world is completely dark and that we are the only ones that are for God, light can still shine. In a moment, we're going to look at Luke 1. We can see the prophecy of Zechariah, which describes his son, John the Baptist, preparing Jesus' way. John the Baptist was preparing Jesus' way during hard times. We'll see that in just a moment. In John 1, 6, it said, There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light, that, that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. And now to Luke. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people and the forgiveness of their sins, because of the tender mercy of our God, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. Why would John 
need to guide our way to the uh, guide our feet into the way of peace if there was not hard times before that. Jesus can give light to everyone. This Jesus, this light, is for everyone. John 1, 9, 10, the true light which gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. And what a sad thing that the world doesn't know Jesus because every time that we look around, we see light. We'll get more into that in just a few moments. There's no variation in light. And I'm still talking about that electromagnetic spectrum that you guys may have just kind of let it go through your heads. But there's no variation in light. That means radio waves, microwaves, infrared, visible light, ultraviolet light, x-ray and gamma rays. If you remember that little squiggly line that I had, those are all light. And that's all these very things up here. The only thing that we see is the visible light, the one that is uh, right here. The rest of it consumes 99.99365% of all light is invisible light. But there's no variation. Radio wave is the exact same thing as visible light. A radio wave is the exact same thing as a gamma ray. And you probably didn't know that or you don't remember that. But the only difference is the waveform itself is a little different in size. Otherwise, it's all light. What's the spiritual connection? We see in James 1.17, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. How interesting it is that, that it says Father of lights, and then it follows that with no variation, when it's a fact that there's no variation in light with the exception of the waveform. And then we see in Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Think about that. Do, do we really want physical light to change? If we have a blue car and we go into the grocery store, and then we come back out, and then now our car's red because it, it's different. The waveform changed. How are we going to know what, where our car is? Because in general, you don't usually remember. Like Nathan said this morning, we, we easily forget. But you're looking for a different color car. We don't want that in God. We don't want that in Jesus. Do we re really want him to change? Today, God says this is sin, and tomorrow he says something else. How, you, how would you ever follow that? Or if Jesus says, Jesus is light, and if we follow him, and there's no darkness, as we see here in John 8, 12, again, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. What if he said something else tomorrow? You could never trust in what God would say. Why would you ever trust the Bible? But there is no variation in what Jesus says. We can trust him, and I'm thankful that the scriptures say that there's no variation. Now, what about colors? Colors that we see here, we see red, orange, yellow, green, blue, and violet. And I know there's somebody out there that's going to say, you're missing indigo. Uh, if you do a lot of studying, they're saying indigo is not necessarily a color. It's just a, a form of violet there. Anyways, violet or visible light only makes up 0.0035% of light, which I've already mentioned before. The human eye only sees that small percentage of light. We understand these things because they are visible to us. We can see the pews are purple, close to purple. We see the walls are tan. My shirt is white. We have yellow. We have blue. We have all these colors around us. We see that. What is that? It's light. It's around us. We see it when we look outside. Isaiah 1.18, uh, the scriptures describe these colors. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. They use these words to describe it, but they also have a deeper meaning. We'll get to that in just a moment. There are two colors I did not mention. They are white and they are black. And there are a reason, because they are not lights that shine through a prism. However, the first thing we're going to go to is white. White, from a scientific standpoint, is defined as a complete mixture of all the wavelengths of visible spectrum. So all the colors that we mentioned before, the six colors I mentioned, when they are all reflected back, they show white. And there's a reason for that. The spiritual connection is white, when you combine all the colors, is a sign of purity. 
purity as we see in the Bible in the transfiguration of Jesus. First one is Matthew 17, 2. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light. Mark 9, 3. And his clothes became radiant, intensely white, as no one on earth could bleach them. In Luke 9, 29. And as he was praying, the appearance of his face was altered, and his clothing became dazzling white. In Revelation 7, 14. Says then one of the elders addressed th- addressed me, saying, "Whose are these clothed in white robes, and from where have they come?" I said to him, "Sir, you know." And he said to me, "These are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Their robes became white because Jesus had pure blood. Because of all the beautiful things that Jesus accomplished, he he made uh, he perfected." The law was perfected through him. We see Revelation 19, 14. And the armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. The white apparel is the result of being pure. The purification of sins, which happens for the believer at the moment of salvation, based on the work of the Lord Jesus, who paid for our sins. Without Jesus fulfilling every commandment, every portion of the visible light, can say, he would not have been wearing white linen. He had to completely fulfill the law, which he did. We see here, knowing, uh, 1 Peter 1.18 says, knowing that you were ransomed from feudal ways, inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. Again, Jesus was perfect. He completely absorbed the law. He completely reflected all the colors. And that's what made him shine in that spotless, unblemished, white look. He fulfilled the law. Now we have the other color that we didn't mention in the spectrum, which is black. From a uh, scientific standpoint, black is the absorption of all colors. It doesn't reflect any color that hits it. The literal definition is devoid of light. And then we see this uh, spiritual connection in uh, 1 John 1, 5. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you. That God is light and in him is no darkness at all. Darkness is the absence of God. If all the wavelengths of this visible spectrum that we have, if none of them can reflect back, they're absorbed, we get this color black. We get this dark and it's connected with evil. We see this in Genesis 1, And God saw that light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God separated this light from darkness, and he divided this darkness. Light, the white light, the light, full light, is God, and we know this. The absence of that is darkness. It can be also seen as Satan. So why are people afraid of darkness? Because they can't see in front of them, behind them, beside them. We see in John 12, 35, So Jesus said to them, The light is among you for a little while longer. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. The one who walks in the darkness does not know where he is going. While you have the light, believe in the light, that you may become sons of light. And then Psalm 27, 1, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is my stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Jesus is our light. We just need to follow him. We need to allow him to guide us in our lives. Why else would we be afraid of darkness? Because God is not in the darkness. God is in the light. And that should bring shivers down your spine if you think about it. This is an interesting point that I came across. Man-made darkness cannot completely absorb light. This material called Vantablack is so black that it absorbs all but 0.0035% of visual light. You can look at this one of two ways. Number one, darkness can com- completely consume you, which we re- read in John 12. That's especially if you're never looking for the light. But then number two, there's still a chance that light can escape. Ephesians 5, 8 through 11 says, For at one time you were darkness, but now you are the light in the Lord. 
Walk as children of light, for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. How do you think you converted from darkness to light if you didn't already have a little light in you? How can we say that about others around us? Sometimes we think there's no hope for that person. They're too dark. They're too evil. Don't, they don't deserve the kingdom of heaven. That's not true. This is just a side point. I have another point later that will even describe it even further. Right here. In Genesis 126, Then God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. In 1 Thessalonians 5.5, 5, For you are all children of light, children of the day. We are not of the night or of the darkness. We're all children of the light. We were made in his image. If you think about what is an image, except a reflection of the light coming back at you. How, it's, it's, it's amazing, the connection between light and God. Obviously, God is light, and then what we physically can see and point to in the scriptures. All right, enough about the, the light that we can see. Let's look at light as an energy. We already kind of covered this briefly earlier, but something else that we notice is from light is warmth or heat, and this is described as energy. Now, we remember talking about nature's way of transferring, light is nature's way of transferring energy from itself to outside objects or people. Earlier, we also talked about how God created light first, in essence, energy, which makes sense. Uh, we also talked about how we need to expose the darkness in Ephesians 5. When we expose these things, shine the lights on them, we transfer light to them, which is a very real physical and spiritual connection that God has given us. We are literally transferring energy onto them so they turn away from their darkness. Where does all this energy come from? Of course, it's from God. We see this Genesis 1-3, God provided the light. But then we see here, let's make this little roundabout way of, of energy. Nuclear reactions in the sun cause atoms to release heat, light, and other electromagnetic energy. Corn uses the energy from the sun to make molecules. The uh, chickens eat the corn. The girl eats the chicken. The girl rides the bike, goes up a hill, and then pr produces more energy by going down the hill. Where did all of this start? Genesis 1-3. Energy was from the beginning. Light was from the beginning, just as we have described. This eternal power the sun is nature. The sun produces energy, energy in the form of light. How amazing this is. We see this connection here in 1 Corinthians as well. 1 Corinthians uh, uh, was speaking of the divisions of the church, but they also note energy here as well. What then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you believed, as the Lord assigned to each. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything but only God who gives the growth. What do you think growth is? Growth is energy. Growth is allowing you to use the energy. All coming from God, which is the light. What an amazing connection. This is pretty interesting here itself too. Uh, everything that has physical light, there, it's all well known scientifically. This one I didn't know about, so I wanted to include where I got my source. It's from Penn State University. Since some of the par particles within an object are charged, energy, any object with a temperature above absolute zero, or zero Kelvin for some of you, or negative 273 Celsius uh, for others, will contain moving charged particles, energy, so it will emit light. Okay, now you might think, well, what is it, what's he saying here? Anything that is warm at all, even if it's really cold and ice, still emits light. Ephesians 5, 13 through 14. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore, it says, Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. So even in the darkest, 
coldest caves, light is still able to pass, even if it's just a small amount. This should give us hope that if there's someone in the darkest point in their life, you might be sitting here this very night, that there is still light in you. Even if you are ice cold, this is why we must always let our light shine. If your temperature is above 273 degrees Celsius, which is extremely cold, you have light in you. Christ can expose that light and can rid you of your darkness, no matter how dark you think you are. Light can always emit. So we know here that light has these dual qualities, which is a particle energy, and it's also this wavelength with this visible with through colors. We can feel it. We see it. But we take it for granted. And we shouldn't, because we live and we move and we have our being in it, as we saw in Acts. Let's just be kind of weird for a moment. I want you to look around you. I want you to notice the colors of everyone's shirts, the colors of the chairs. Then I want you to shut your eyes. Shut your eyes. I want you to hold your breath just for a moment. You can breathe. Now I want you to stop your heart from beating. You can't do it. Initially, I had you look at the light. I had you look at the visible light. I wanted you to see that. And I closed your eyes. I wanted you to notice the darkness. But then I had you to hold your breath, stop the energy of you breathing. Of course, I don't, if you're still holding your breath, please breathe. And then I asked you to stop your heart from beating. But you couldn't. Why? Because it has energy as the light that God has given you. You live, you move, you have your being in him. And you may not have even thought that light is the very thing that's keeping you alive right now. Don't take that for granted. I have four characteristics of light. Uh, we have absorption, reflection, refraction, transmission. I'm just going to briefly cover these. Absorption is defined as the energy from light is transferred to the surface material. A few questions for you. Am I absorbing God through prayer, through study, for not forsaking the saints, teaching, holding fast to the word? Reflection, which is defined as bouncing back of light ray after hitting any surface. Am I reflecting God, Jesus, or the word? Now what about refraction? Refraction is the bending of light wave when it enters a medium where its speed is different. Now you might uh, question what this means, but if you think about it, take a straw, take a clear glass of water, put the straw in it. You'll notice from the side the straw is at a different angle. This is refraction. It's bending the light. Do I bend for God or do I try to bend God's word to fit me? And then transmission. Getting the light from one place to another. Am I shining my light or am I putting it under a lampshade? This is an interesting point here, Genesis to Revelation. We see in Genesis 1-3, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. And then at the end, we're, we're going to conclude with Revelation 22-5, and night will be no more. They will need no light of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. God created the physical light, the physical light that we can learn and study and learn from spiritually. We're not going to need any more because we should understand what his spiritual light is. We see that in Revelation. We're not going to need the physical light anymore. We're going to have his spiritual light. So I said I was going to come back to Romans 1, 19, and here it is. <clears throat> I'm going to read these verses, and what I want you to understand is I'm not adding to these verses. I'm trying to, to show you the, the points, the connections that we can see from these. So here it is. For what can be known about God is plain to them. Plain to them in the visible light can shine in good times and bad, Jesus and purity. Because God has shown it to them through Jesus, through this visible light that we can see. For his invisible attributes, his electromagnetic spectrum, when I talked about gamma rays and x-rays and microwaves and all these other different kinds of waves, those are all his invisible attri attributes which, which make up 99.9965% of all light. And namely, his eternal power, energy, and when I say energy, it's way more than, it, than that. I'm just making a point here. In divine, godlike nature, how light works, 
have been clearly perceived. Visible light again, Jesus and purity. Ever since the creation of the world, Genesis 1-3, there's no variation throughout time in God's word. In the things that have been made, again, Genesis, so they are without excuse. John 8, 12, again, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. We also noted that again, in the darkest man-made material, the darkest man-made black can absorb all the light. And if your temperature is above negative 273 degrees, light can still be emitted. You have no excuse not to follow the light. So if you're a Christian and you're walking and you're in the deepest, darkest, coldest cave, you're trying to walk without a flashlight. You're trying to live in that cave and try to see. But if you, you, if you take Jesus as your light, he can expose every hole. He can help you avoid every trap to avoid it. Earlier we read 1 John 1, 5. Continuing in verse 6, it says, If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus his son cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we walk in this light, the light that will clearly lead our paths, we will have redemption for our sins. You have an opportunity, if you're not a Christian, to be baptized tonight. If you are a Christian, do people describe you like they describe Daniel in Daniel 5? It says, I have heard of you that the Spirit of God is in you, and that light and understanding and excellent wisdom are found in you. If you're a Christian, do people say this about you? Do people say, I have heard of you? that the Spirit of God is in you and that light and understanding and excellent wisdom are found in you? If not, why not? We can pray for you. We can pray with you tonight. He not only created the light, but he also created you in his image. The image, the light reflecting back of him. No matter how dark you think that you are, no matter how cold you are, light can still reflect and emit. Take this time to, to stand, to come forward if you need to, and to sing.